All right. Everybody ready? All right. I'd like to call a public hearing for the Gurney Village Board to order. It's a public hearing to consider contributing 600000 and rebating up to 900000 of sales tax revenue to Kensington Development Group, <coughs> LLC, to allow for site development and construction of a minimum 10,500 square foot commercial building for Cooper's Hawk Restaurant at 7735 Grand Avenue. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Here. Thorstenson. Here. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. O'Brien. Present. Thomas. Present. Six present. All right. Um, if once you're done, then I'll um, have Brian swear in anybody from the public. So go ahead. Okay. Ellen. Thank you, Mayor. So we're very pleased tonight to be able to bring forward a project that I think, as you know, has been in the works for quite a while um, and at the top of our residents' wish list for quite a while. Um, so Cooper's Hawk Winery and Restaurant has 45 locations across 10 states, 13 in the Chicago area, the newest of which was actually developed by Kensington. We opened in Morton Grove just a couple weeks ago, the end of March. Um, the other closest locations to us would be Wheeling, Arlington Heights, South Barrington, and there is one in Wisconsin located in Brookfield in the Milwaukee area. So the concept is, is actually has several parts to it. It's a what they call upscale casual full service restaurant uh, with a full service bar. It has a Napa style tasting room and a retail gift shop really all under one roof. So this, con this physical concept plus the membership-driven wine club pulls from, from a wide geographic area. They've got a devoted following. I think I read that nationwide there are 450,000 wine club members. So, you know, this is a devoted following, and they sponsor wine dinners and theme parties, and it's really all about the, the, the community and the wine. So when they were looking for locations, and they've been looking for a while, it was really about finding a location that was embedded in our community. They really didn't want to be just a commercial building stuck in a commercial area. They really liked the idea of a site surrounded by neighborhoods and, and looking forward to establishing that relationship with the community. And then they seemed very sincere about that, and I think they were in that it took them this long and the expertise of, of Kensington to be able to deliver the site for them to, to get them to finally you know decide to locate. Um, so the... Um, uh, you know, because of because of this geographic appeal, this regional appeal, we think it fits very well with Gurney's market position and the idea of visitors, you know, seeking out this destination site, which is will be located on our western near our western boundary, just benefits the entire Grand Avenue shopping and dining corridor as these visitors, you know, see these other businesses. So recruiting distinctive users like Cooper's Hawk, um, which has this following, um, and the user-generated revenue of bringing in visitor you know, revenue is, is key to our brand, and it's the way that we provide village services without a property tax, as we've done for so many years. So this is a strategic move. Uh, pending approval of tonight's agreement, Cooper's Hawk would be joining the College of Lake County on the site of the former Lowe's. Um, so while CLC is completely transforming the interior of the building, as you can sort of get a glimpse here, um, they, and they've hired Gurney-based Leggett architects to do that work. It's, it's going to be tremendous. Um, you know, at the same time, Cooper's Hawk and Kensington will be developing this new outlot on the two and a half acre parcel at the corner of Rollins and Grand. So the inside and the outside are both going to be adding square footage at the same time and really taking on a whole new life. And the way that that's happening is that Kensington actually made it possible, helped facilitate CLC's purchase of the building, uh, but in so doing, they also retained the right, the contract, contractual right to repurchase that corner for a restaurant should it become a, you know, a, a possibility. So to achieve this full site utilization, um, obviously at the time that we're in, post, you know, post 2020, um, in such a really a short span of time, that Lowe's has actually only been dark for a couple of years. To completely be able to repurpose it and add square footage both in and out, I think is very exciting, and we're glad to be able to bring these two good neighbors together. So as with our prior redevelopment agreements, this one is with the landlord, in this case, Kensington Development Group. So Kensington will develop the outlet um, and build the building and lease to Cooper's Hawk for a minimum of 15 years. Um, and, to, and to accomplish this, the agreement really needed to have two components to it, one of which is tied to 
completion of construction. That's the direct contribution, the $600,000. That's as soon as Cooper's Hawk opens its doors to the public, that's the, that's the agreement we're proposing. Um, actually, Kensington would have liked it earlier, but we held fast to that they need to be open. So we know that that happens. Um, the remaining uh, $900,000, or maximum of, of nine, for a total of 1.5, has to be earned. It's earned through a rebate of 100% of the state shared sales tax and 50% of the village's home rule sales tax, with us retaining the other 50% as we do for capital. Um, and of course, the 1% food and beverage tax um, is retained by us throughout the entire term. So with those two revenues, even in the first four to five years, staff has projected that we'll recoup that initial direct $600,000 contribution. Um, and then after that, for the remainder of the term, the annual net new revenue to us is about 100 to 150. And then beyond that, when the agreement is expired and we just have Cooper's Hawk, hopefully for the next you know, 10 or, or more years, um, that revenue would likely be over $300,000 annually in sales tax and food and beverage tax. Then you add to that uh, the anticipated property tax revenue, which at the size of this building is probably in the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range, which obviously doesn't benefit us, but it benefits our jurisdictional partners. And then um, on the front end, the building permit revenue um, is anticipated at about hundred thousand dollars for fiscal year 21-22. So several components to, you know, to how this all makes good financial sense. Um, the stellar track records of you know the coming out of the pandemic. Cooper Sock is still adding locations. They've been, they've grown quickly, but very smartly since 2005. It's still under private ownership. Same, same guy who founded it, still involved. Um, and here they are 45 locations later. So we feel good about that track record. We certainly feel good about Kensington's track record. They developed our Aldi in town and they know Cooper Sock having just opened the Morton Grove location with them. So there's, there's long-term partnership here. Um, so we have that confidence, but to undergird that confidence, we have structured the agreement so that the capital investment, you know, minimum of $4.5 million in the building, minimum total of 7.5 in the whole project. You know, we're getting a solid additional commercial building that we will have in our community serving us long beyond any one tenant and how they may or may not perform and what their longevity may or may not be. So um, with all of that consideration, you know, we, we are really looking forward to lots of exciting, you know, grand openings and groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings out of that Lowe's site, putting it to active reuse. Um, and staff respectfully recommends adoption of this agreement. Um, appreciate everybody's interest and support. And I do have Chad Jones with Kensington uh, if, if there are any questions for Kensington. And I'll add, and Ellen minimizes how hard we've worked, probably for the last three years, at least a dozen developers in every meeting I would be, I want a Cooper's Hawk. Bring me a Cooper sock and we can talk. Um, and I'm very pleased that when I said that to Kensington, when they were looking at this site, I said, I want a Cooper sock and you delivered. I, I had my doubts. Um, <laughs> and we were probably not at the top of Cooper's Hawk list either. They were familiar with the area, um, but you know, we did a good sales job. Kensington did, did a good sales job and it's the incentives that are really bringing this to us. <laughs> at the top of the list has always been that higher end restaurant um, that's non-chain, uh, although 45 is getting up there. Um, but this really has been consistently from our residents, whether it's social media or email to me. So this was a tough one, but we always knew it's hardest to get that first high end restaurant. And right. then you start building out, it's nice use for the West End. Yes. Um, great repurpose of that Lowe's site. Um, this probably alone will make up for the sales tax we lost from Lowe's um, with the following that they have. So um, this is quite the feather in our cap for Gurney to land this. Questions from the trustees? Okay, um, is there anyone from the public who'd like to comment on this public hearing? You'd have to be sworn in if you did. All right. Um, if no one has any objections, do I have, we'll vote on it at the regular meeting. Um, right now it's just a recommendation to leave this to the board meeting for a vote. Recommend. So, uh, motion by Trustee Quinn, uh, Trustee O'Brien, second by Trustee Balmas. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. 
Garner? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Thomas? Aye. Six aye. All right. We will be voting on this at our regular meeting. So, Brian, do I have to close this one and then reopen it? Yes. Um, yes. If it's, okay. And we All right. have to wait five minutes. So. Wait. Okay. So do I have a motion to adjourn the so public hearing? <laughs> motion by Trustee Garner. Second. Second by Trustee Thorstensen. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, we have five minutes before the next, four minutes before. <laughs> I'd like to call a public hearing on the fiscal year 2021-2022 proposed budget <coughs> to order. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Here. Thorstenson. Here. Ross. Here. Connor. Here. O'Brien. Present. Thomas. <coughs> present. Six present. All right. This is what makes the wheels on the bus go round is the budget, so uh -oh. take it away, Brian. Thank you. Uh, as the mayor said, the purpose is to hold a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 21-22 budget. Um, I'll walk through a pretty high-level overview here. Obviously, the budget document has a lot more detail, uh, but I'll do my best to try to condense it here down, down to 15 minutes or so. Uh, this slide shows the financial planning and reporting process. Uh, it starts with two long-term plans, the financial forecast and the capital plan. We talked about those on January 25th. That led into the first budget workshop uh, on March 1st, and then brings us to tonight uh, for the public hearing and approval for a fiscal year start date of May 1st. A few minor updates since the budget workshop uh, in the general fund, revenues and expenditures both uh, decreased by 84,000 for a net change of zero. So uh, really these were changes to um, police services as you know the, the needs of our customers kind of came into focus here over the last couple months. Um, that was offset by adjusting local use tax. Uh, we had originally had <coughs> programmed in uh, a bigger impact of the new sales tax laws that went into effect uh, January 1st than we needed to. Still uh, below the IML estimate, so we're still conservative on that, uh, just not as conservative as we were, so we could offset some of those other adjustments. Uh, the capital fund expenditures were reduced by 35,000. What we did was we re removed a fire department alerting system um, and then in the water and sewer fund, added 40000 for a generator at the Heather Ridge water tower. Budget factors this year, obviously COVID was the biggest one, uh, not only impacting the big three, but in turn impacting the big four revenues, uh, sales tax, amusement, hotel, food, and beverage. That's what we're talking about there. Uh, this year we initiated the fiscal contingency plan, obviously, with the, with the uh, pandemic that had an impact on personnel, um, scrutinizing, freezing some positions, uh, not rehiring, and then capital. Uh, also in the upcoming budget, we were able to leverage what we we'll call relief valves. Um, these are restricted funds or excess fund balance that we would rely on in this situation. Um, so it, wor it, it all worked out perfect. Uh, we were able to utilize motor fuel tax uh, that we had saved up and actually got some additional funding from some capital plans at the state level. Um, police restricted revenue money, and then some excess fleet services fund uh, balance that was left over from last year. From a debt, debt standpoint, the village only has two outstanding uh, debt instruments, the IEPA loan, and then a promissory note for Fire Station 3. Uh, general fund fund balance uh, over two fiscal years, so this includes where we think we'll finish this year and budgeted for next year, uh, proposing using just under $4 million. Uh, next year included in the budget is a use of fund balance, excess fund balance of 922000 which leaves us at the end of next year projected about $22.8 million or 55, just over 55% versus a policy of 35%. So we're still, still doing very well from a, from a fund balance standpoint, um, which is why we, why we have the fund balance is to use it for times like this. So um, outcomes of the budget process. 21st year no property tax. We were able to continue a pretty aggressive capital plan, actually. Uh, minimal debt. Now, the only additional debt going on this year is for the fire station. Uh, some strategic personnel changes, uh, economic development participation. So that's our uh, rebate agreements, and then preserve that general fund balance. Starting with personnel, 72.1% of all personnel is related to public safety, about 15% for public works, and then the other 15% or 13% for community development and admin. 
Total budget at FTE is almost 224. Uh, this year we put into the budget document an unbudgeted column. We have 12 of those. Uh, those are re going to remain unbudgeted, obviously to offset impacts of the pandemic. Uh, we did have a few positions proposed to be filled strategically. Um, an IT systems administrator, a senior civil engineer and community development, uh, I would say police officers and one communications operator um, in the communications department or division. And it's important to note that that communications operator is being reimbursed for the first year costs by the joint ETSP. So no cost to the village for the first year. Going forward, we will. Uh, deposition here, we talked a little bit about it, that um, the tall bar in the middle is where we paid off the series 2011. Just to the right of that um, is the final SSA and the first payment of the IEPA loan, which is in the current year we're in. Next year is just the IEPA loan and the first payment of Fire Station 3. And then the IEPA loan and Fire Station 3 after that. Again, here important to note that until fiscal year 26, the Fire Station 3 uh, debt services paid by the Warren Waukegan Fire Protection District contribution. Uh, this chart, get into the numbers a little bit. Uh, this chart shows us revenues and expenses uh, and any surplus or deficit by fund. Uh, looking at total, revenues 78.8 million. Expenditure 72.5 gives us a surplus of 6.2. Obviously that's mostly from the pension funds if you look a little further down on the chart. General fund is balanced, again, with the use of 922,000 reserves. Revenues and expenditures there totaling 41.2 million. Just a couple other things to point out. To supplement the capital plan, as we've done at least for the last five years, uh, using some impact fee, uh, impact fee fund uh, reserves to offset the sidewalk program and the capital fund, 150,000 there. Uh, in the capital fund, you'll see it's a surplus of 1.2 million. Again, important to note that a million of that is the Warren Waukegan Fire Protection District contribution that'll stay in the fund until we need it for debt service. Water and sewer uh, combined here, uh, use about 928,000 in uh, fund balance and this finishes off the old grant phase two. Um, and the fund balance in this fund will remain at the end of next year after using this 925, about 3.4 million, which is right at 50% of operating expenditure. So again, we had built that up over time, spent it down over the last five years, waiting for that rate increase from Jawa to drop to bolster the capital program. So this will be the last year of that. Fleet services, uh, as I was talking about those relief valves, this is one of them using 208,000 of excess fund balance in the fleet services fund to offset uh, the general fund contribution still be at the end of end of next year projected to be about 250,000 in there so still for a, a fund that is supposed to net to zero um, having a little bit in there definitely saves us another relief valve for the future if we need it and then the joint ETSB fund we had for for many years now anticipated the replacement of CAD um, and that time has come the village is participating in a consortium with Lake County and a, and a couple other a couple other entities um, to go through that. So CAD is purchasing or drawing down fund balance for, or sorry, the Jetsby is drawing down fund balance for the purchase of CAD and Starcom radios this year. Um, again, we'll still have an 800,000 reserve in there at the end of next year for future capital. This chart shows us revenues uh, by category across all funds. We'll just run through a couple major ones here. Total is 78.8 million, that's down 2.6 million or 3.2%. Major revenues is largest category, totaling 33.3 million or 42% of all revenue. That's down about 6.2%. We'll talk a little bit about the impact of the big four um, on a few slide coming up here. Charges for service, second largest category, totaling 16.2 million or 21% of all revenues. That's down slightly, just a half percent there. Um, primarily water and sewer charges, uh, Warren Waukegan Fire Protection District. Um, it's important to note that there is no water and sewer rate adjustment included in the budget. Um, we decided to forego that, uh, see where we were on the kind of the backside of the pandemic. Investments and contributions, third largest category, 14.4 million, 18% um, of revenues. Uh, essentially, essentially flat up just 0.2%, uh, this is pr 
primarily pension fund investments. Um, it's important to note here, we do budget the pension fund investments at the actuarial assumption of 7%. Um, so that's primarily what is included in, in that category. Expenditures across all funds, total 72.5. That's down almost 5% overall. Obviously, as a, as a service organization here, employees are our largest expense. Uh, salaries and benefits total 42.6 million, about 60% of all expenditures. Uh, salaries on that side, salaries and wages up about 2.6%. Large chunk of that is uh, assumptions for pensioners. Um, obviously, we've had some retirements, so those pension payments will go up. Uh, that's included in this number across all funds. Uh, on the employee benefits side, it's down just slightly 0.6%. Again, where, where we're at with uh, COLA assumptions offset by the 12 vacant positions that we looked at on the personnel side. Capital second largest category, 11.3 uh, account, million accounts for 16% overall. It's down 9.3%. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, on the capital slide and what's included in there. And then contractual services here, 8 million. 11% of all expenditures, that's down 17%. This is road resurfacing program is included in this category in uh, Jawa water costs. Uh, as we talked about many times, the Jawa water costs went down, so that is obviously reflected in this category as well. Specifically general fund, kind of the same two charts here. I'll run through them fairly quick. Uh, total revenues, 41.2 million. That is down, uh, sorry, down 2.1 million or 4.8%. That includes, in total here, that includes 922,000 budgeted for the use of, of reserves. Uh, major revenues uh, accounts for 70% of all general fund revenues. Totals about 29 million. It's down 6.4%. We'll get into the big four on the next slide. Um, and then charges for service here. 17.4% or about 7 million, that's down 1%. Um, again, includes Warren Waukegan Fire Protection District here, dispatch contracts, ambulance revenues, off-duty police security um, charges, and things like that. Major revenues, so this is the largest category of the revenues, what's included in there. Uh, down 2 million or 6.4%. Here's where we see the biggest impact from the pandemic. Um, the approach we took was the big four, so we're talking sales tax, amusement tax, hotel, food, and beverage, would recover 75% of what they lost last year. Um, so that's, those numbers are reflected here. Uh, in total, sales tax down 4.3%, the home rule side's 4.6, um, amusement's down 17.4, food and beverage down just over 10%, and then hotel down 31.4. That's how that 75% recovery kind of shook out in the end. Uh, looking at how, how the money is spent here, obviously public safety is the largest largest um, categories. Police 46.1%, fire almost 30, uh, followed by public works at almost nine, administration just over seven, and then contractual obligations are things that are across the all village uh, departments and community development at 5%. General fund expenditures, again, uh, down 1.1 million or about 2.5% overall. Salaries and benefits being the largest categories of that, 83% of the general fund. Oops, sorry, excuse me. Uh, salaries and wages, 55.6% um, of the total there. Uh, 20, uh, 23 million, that's essentially flat. Again, COLAs versus vacancies. Benefits account for 27.8%, 11.5 million, essentially flat from prior year. Get into other financing sources here. Uh, that's the third largest category, makes up 5.9%, totals about 2.4 million. That's down 477,000 versus last year. That's the reduced fleet services transfer with the, re with the reduction in capital from public works. And um, as well as the reduction in um, rebate agreements. Obviously, if we're not generating tax, there's less to, to be rebated back. So that's where, that's where that comes from. This chart here shows 10 years of general fund balance. Um, the red line indicates or shows where the fund balance policy is based on next year's expenditures. 
So, you know, as you can see, we're utilizing approximately $4 million over two years, the green being the current year we're in and the yellow being what we're looking at tonight, which would be next fiscal year. Um, end of next fiscal year, 22.8 million, 55% of expenditures. And it's important to note that over the, over this 10 year period, we've used over $6 million of general fund fund balance for capital and to pay off that series 2011 bonds early. So not only did we, were we able to grow the fund balance and pretty much maintain it through the, through the pandemic here, um, but we were also able to utilize a lot of those excess funds for capital and put us in a good position from a debt standpoint. Capital program, uh, 13.1 million, obviously the big one here is Fire Station 3. Uh, we break it down into six sections, 4 million on transportation, Buildings, 3.2 million, that includes fire station, three water and sewer, 2.9, big one there, just finishing off the old grand. Vehicles and equipment, 1.1 million, stormwater management, 450,000, and technology, 1.4, 1.4 million. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. That was impressive, considering we've just come through the worst public health crisis in our country's history, probably, so good work to staff. Um, I had two things. Did we get our January sales tax number? We did. It was up 7.8% from wow. January a year ago. And so in January a year ago was really pre before the lockdowns and anything like that. So yeah. we're pretty close to apples to apples there and, and it was up. So it's positive news. Very positive sign. Foreshadow the next report at the next meeting. <laughs> um, CARES Act, do we, because it looks like we'll get enough to replace a lot of what we've, what we're down. So do you have a firm number or firm idea? S latest number I saw was still the 375. The last information I got from the IML is the, the Treasury still working on guidance and Illinois was a little bit unique in that we have so many different governments. They're looking at how that overlaps and that may impact our 375, depending on how they determine how that, you know, what entities or what you know, governmental entities would get what, so. Well, that'll be a decision by the board. I know we want to help the small businesses that have suffered, yep. but to be able to replenish some of the reserves that we've had to use would be comforting too. You guys would sleep better at night, so. Questions from the trustees? All right, again, this is a public hearing. Um, is there anyone from the public that would like to give testimony on our budget proposal. If not, do I have a recommendation for our, to take action at our board meeting? Motion by Trustee Second Gersenson, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Gersenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Success. All right, the recommendation carries, and do I have a motion to adjourn the public hearing? So moved. Motion by Trustee Garner, second by Trustee Balmas. All in favor say aye. 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 Don't go anywhere because we have to start our regular meeting. All right. <coughs> I'd like to call the Gurney Village Board regular meeting of April 12th, 2021 to order. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Here. Thorstenson. Here. Ross. Here. Garner. Here. O'Brien. Present. Thomas. Present. Six present. All right. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. All right, good evening. First, congratulations, Trustee Balmas, Trustee Thorstensen, Clerk Harris on your reelection. Congratulations to our newly elected trustee, Kevin Woodside, and a very hearty, from my heart, congratulations to Mayor-elect Tom Hood. Thank you. All right. Enough of that, now it's time to work. 
All right, first up is approval of the consent agenda as Double. presented. Motion by Trustee Balmas. Second. Second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. Six aye. All right, motion carries. Patrick, please read the consent agenda into the record. Item number one, approval of the minutes from the March 1st, 2021 and March 15th, 2021 meetings. Item number two, approval of ordinance 2021-21, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between Lake County and the Village of Gurney for animal care and control services. Item number three, approval of setting the following bid dates. May 10th, 2021, floodplain property demolition project 4609, 4611, 4617, and 4625 Old Grand Avenue. May 24, 2021, Cemetery Road Monopole Construction Project. At number four, approval of payroll for period ending March 12, 2021, in the amount of $801,485.19. At number five, approval of payroll for period ending March 26, 2021, in the amount of $813,000. $946.90. Item number six, approval of bills for period ending April 12, 2021, in the amount of $2,410,610.63. All Thank you, Patrick. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by Trustee Ross, second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Thomas? Aye. Six aye. Motion carries. Move to petitions and communications. The first is a presentation uh, by Lake County Board Chair Sandy Hart. It's a proclamation. So Chairwoman Hart, the floor is yours. Okay. All right. Oh, a handheld. Okay. Oh, Here. No, this is fine. I just didn't. I just didn't know where you wanted me. So, um, thank you so much, and uh, just really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here to honor uh, Mayor Kavorth for her many, many years of service. So, I am speaking on behalf of Lake County Board. Uh, there's another board member um, who was unable to be here tonight. Unfortunately, she, um, her father passed away over the weekend, and I know she really wanted to be here, so she sends her um, congratulations and her thanks as well. So this is a proclamation offering sincere appreciation to Christina Kavoric for her years of service to the Village of Gurnee and Lake County. Whereas Christina Kavoric has devoted 24 years to public service. Prior to beginning her role as the Mayor of Gurnee in May 2005, she served as a plan commissioner for two years and as a village trustee for six years. And whereas Christina Kavoric oversaw the institution of a five-year financial planning process and award-winning budgets that did not rely on property taxes or utility taxes. And whereas Christina Kavoric helped spearhead countless business attraction efforts, including community favorites such as Portillo's, Macy's, and Great Wolf Lodge, and elevated Gurney's position as a leading tourism destination in the Midwest by leveraging strategic partnerships. And whereas she encouraged a variety of housing types to meet community needs, including workforce, millennial, and several assisted and supportive living and age in place developments, she also was a leading voice in addressing food and housing insecurity. And whereas Christina Kavoric increased the focus on infrastructure investment, overseeing the largest capital programs in village history, including the Knolls Road Water Tower, Fire Station Number Three, the reconstruction of Almond Road, and Bell Plain at Magnolia Avenues, and whereas she strengthened interagency cooperation, making efficient use of taxpayer resources and providing valued community amenities and services, including Fit Nation, the Hunt Club Aquatic Center, Gurney Days, and 211 Lake County, and whereas focused on regional stormwater planning, Christina Kavoric advocated for the removal of nearly 27 flood, flood plain properties, and I think you just approved three more, on your consent agenda, so that should be 30, <laughs> including the relocation of the Gurney Grade School and provided community leadership through multiple floods, including the significant flooding in 2007, 2013, 2017, and 2019. 
And whereas Christina Kavorik has been involved with multiple county organizations, including the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, Lake County Stormwater Management Commission, where I got to meet Mayor Kavorik, uh, Central Lake County Joint Action Water Agency, and the Lake County Affordable Housing Commission. And whereas Christina Kavorik and her husband Gerald have lived in South Ridge since 1992 and are the proud parents of four adult children and grandparents to four grandchildren. Now therefore be it proclaimed, County Board Chair Sandy Hart offers sincere gratitude and appreciation to Christina Kavorik for her years of outstanding and dedicated public service to the citizens of Gurnee and Lake County, dated at Waukegan, Illinois, on May 3, 2021. It's a little bit early because I know that's your last day. That's but I so just really want to thank you um, for your guidance and help and mentorship when I started in uh, early 20, or excuse me, late 2012. And uh, it has been just a real pleasure to get to work with you and learn from you. Uh, we've been able to serve on a couple of boards and commissions together and uh, just really enjoyed uh, spending time with you and I'm pleased to call you my friend. So thank you for everything you've done for the village and for Lake County overall. So thank, thank you. you. That was really nice. Let's do a picture for Jack. Okay, Listening to that, I should be like more tired than I am. <laughs> Somebody get a picture of Jack. Jack, oh, okay. take a picture. Where do you want him, Jack, up here? Oh, he's been moving a while. going to get harder. <laughs> it actually makes me want to get back in and keep fighting. <laughs> Sorry, Christy. I know. <laughs> Too late. Too late. This was fun. All right. Great 24 years. Um, next up is approval of a proclamation de designating April 11th through 17th, April 11th through April 17th, 2021 as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week in the Village of Gurney. Do I have a motion so to moved. approve? Motion by Trustee O'Brien. Second. Second by Trustee Thorstenson. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes, and I saw we did some nice social media on this. All right. So. All right. That's it for petitions and communications. Next up is the report on the... Uh, Assistant to the Administrator, Jack, is going to walk us through our electrical aggregation program. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Board. So another year, another uh, appearance for me for the electric aggregation program. I also have Sharon Derling here from NIMEC in case there's any questions I can't answer on the program. So since we have been here pretty much every year for the last few years, I'll do a quick walkthrough just of the history just to kind of talk a little bit about the program. And then what I'll do is I'll walk into a couple of the options. And I am looking for feedback from the board at the end of this. Um, so started in 2012, referendum, uh, opt-out program. So essentially, we would go purchase electricity at a rate usually lower than ComEd for residents. Uh, for many years, we had great success. The residents saved a lot of money on the program. Um, as time went on, it got more and more competitive. So ComEd's rates came down a little bit. The private rates went up a little bit. Um, a big change was in the contracts after the polar vortex. They no longer put in that there could be a community-wide opt-out. So when you committed to a program, you committed to that price for the entire year. What we started to feel like, and communities all around the state felt like, is you were gambling with residents' money. Um, so it became risky. A lot of programs ended. We were able to keep good pricing up until the very end. And when we were probably about ready to hang up our hats, uh, in 2019, MC Squared, who was our vendor at the time, they introduced their Eco Green program. So we made the switch that year. 
The Eco Green program is 100% renewable, so all of our residents, all the electricity that we consume, and all of our small customer accounts are 100% renewable for pro people that are in the program. Uh, and then what they do is they price match it to ComEd. So whatever ComEd's rate is, we pay the same. So that way, if ComEd, they're fairly price stable, they are lower than any of the private bids, it's a win-win. So we get 100% renewable energy for no additional cost to residents. Um, last year, we went with the Ledger Energy. Same thing, so now all of a sudden there's actually multiple companies offering the same product. So how they differentiate with each other, they price match with ComEd, but now they do a thing that's a civic contribution. So essentially they provide funds that can be used for a variety of sources to the municipality, to the, the public body, um, to use for anything that they wish. So this is a way that you can kind of differentiate the bids. So I'll walk through a couple of kind of how this works. So. When you do a pricing for and how they're able to do this, because obviously there's kind of like what's the catch type of thing is always the question. So when we look at this green line I have here, let's say this is ComEd's rate. Now this is a few years old, but let's say it was 7.8 cents a kilowatt hour. That's how ComEd sets their rate. Now you take 10 customers, they're all along the spectrum. Some of these customers are these off-peak customers. These are the ones in green. These are people who don't turn their AC on, they work the night shift, they work off hours. So these customers are very valuable and profitable to the companies. These peak customers, these are customers that aren't as profitable. Right now, I will go into that red circle as I've kind of gone from heat to AC to heat in the last couple of weeks. Um, so these customers aren't as profitable. So what happens in a traditional electric aggregation program, how we used to work, the company who won, they took these green off-peak customers, they're profitable. They also had to take the peak customers who are not as profitable, and then ComEd would get the opt-out customers so that they would go to ComEd, and they're basically neutral, we'll say. In the green energy program, the company can only take the profitable accounts. They then move all the <coughs> non-profitable accounts to ComEd, but for all of those customers, what they do is if they're, as long as they're not opted out of the program, 100% of their electric that they use, they purchase as renewable. So even if you're not with Allegio or MC Squared previously, you are still in the program and you're getting 100% renewable energy. So just a little bit of how this bill works. So this would be what a residence bill would look like uh, if they were with ComEd and also a residence bill if they were with Allegio. So when we look at it, Essentially, it's almost the identical cost, so it would be $145 for this resident, but it is broken down a little bit differently, so it does look a little different. And kind of what this means, what's the, the environmental impact, what's the sustainability impact? So the estimate is for one year of this program, every year that we're in this program, is about 76 million pounds of coal fewer burned by us being in this program. So we're purchasing less brown energy, as it's called, and more renewable energy sources, so we're supporting the endeavor. We also look kind of, as a side note, kind of a nice uh, part of the program, is the EPA does the green power partner communities. So they recognize communities that essentially use l high levels of renewable energy. Uh, they rank the communities in the top 100 na nationally. Uh, Gurney, we are, were ranked 83rd last year by energy used nationally. So this is comparing to big communities throughout the country, um, you know, even some that are a million plus population. And to put it in perspective, we used 107 uh, million kilowatt hours of renewable wind energy last year. So now it gets in the pricing. So we just got the pricing today. I will note these prices are very different from what were in your uh, packets. <coughs> Reason being is the pricing is only good essentially for a short period of time. The bids came in at two today and then they're due signed and they're only good through next Tuesday. So this is a lot of information I'm gonna throw at you, but I'll kind of walk through just a little bit of it. So we got two bidders, once again, it's Allegio and MC Squared are kind of the two players in the market that are really competing. They both want our business. MC Squared we were with for four years, Allegio we've been with a year. So how they differentiate, they're both green, both 100% match to ComEd. There's no option that we can rebate residents through it. It just doesn't work that way through these programs. So the differentiation is the civic contribution. Uh, if we did a 0% renewable, so you did a 0% renewable, well, MC squared would provide 250,000 to the municipality, Allegio would do 228. On the opposite spectrum, if you went to 100% renewable, which our program is now, 
we would from the ledger receive $192,952 broken up over 12 payments. Uh, MC squared would do 25,000. So as you can see, as you go more renewable energy credits, uh, a ledger is significantly does provide more civic contribution. Um, MC squared is less unless you're at the 0% renewable. So here's kind of where I guess I'm looking for direction, just a little bit of kind of the pros and cons, things to think about. So one of the things we talk about is this renewable versus mixed renewable. Um, so the pro pros of choosing like a 100% renewable program, it's a positive environmental impact, the clear purpose of the program. So when we share to residents, why are we doing this? What's the point of this? Why not just move everyone to ComEd? Um, this is why, is because we have a 100% renewable program, it's a good environmental move we can do without any additional cost to residents. The cons, essentially, is that there's the smaller civic contribution, which obviously we never got into this for this purpose. Um, and then also just there's less competition and options. If you go to 100% uh, renewable, really, Allegio is much more competitive. When we talk about the two companies, uh, the one thing we talked about last year was concern over the company's ratings. MC squared is five star rated. Uh, when we worked with them for many years, they're great. Call centers out of Chicago. Um, they're the largest provider of this program in the state. A lot of communities are with MC squared. Only a few are with Allegio. Uh, and then they did have the best civic contribution for a zero or 5% renewable. Allegio Energy, on the other hand, uh, is currently four star rated. They're our current company. Um, they actually have gone up in ratings the last year. Um, they did have some history of poor customer service practices back in the mid 2000s. That was some of the concern I raised last year. I will say from our first year, we had pretty positive, um, not many complaints. There were a few obviously for the renewal, but it, w it wasn't too poor. Um, the call center residents do sometimes have to talk to either international or non-local uh, call centers. And then also it's, um, it has the best civic contribution for renewable energy. So with this in mind, kind of looking at the different options. So the bids are gonna be good through next Tuesday. Um, and kind of following direction from the board, looking at sort of what we're, we're seeing. Um, I'll bring a signed contract next Monday, and then we'll go through the next, the following steps through the program. Uh, so in May, the residents get the opt out, opt in. Uh, most residents don't need to take action. They do need to opt out every time we do this. So every time we do this, if they want out, they do have to do it every time, unless they really want to push it and want to forever be, have their name scrubbed from the register. Um, we can do that. Uh, usually I send it to Sharon. Sharon can remove them from the list. Um, another thing to note is, so then in early June, if we do switch programs, so last year there was some confusion because we did go to a new company, all residents get a notice saying essentially that your electricity has been switched, so your provider has been switched. That a lot of times is a red flag for a scam, so we did get a lot more calls than normal whenever we switch. So that's one of the considerations. Switching between companies every year uh, isn't too favorable. And then um, on July 1 is when the new program begins, the new program year. So when we talk about this, I guess kind of what the options are. I know this is kind of different, but it's something I do need a little bit of board feedback just because it's not myself making the determination, is the 100% renewable versus some spectrum of it, and then also seeing the companies and the differences. Um, I have a question about the call centers. So people are really getting their energy from ComEd. So if they're having a problem, wouldn't they call ComEd? Or would they, what is the reason they would have to call the call center? Basically just to opt out. So they would fill out the forms, but if they're having some sort of issue with their opt out, it's pretty much during the enrollment period. So most residents don't. I will say when we go through this, we do have residents who call in confusion. Um, sometimes they're, they're concerned because they want to stay with the, the Villages program, so they will call at that period. So that's where it could happen. I will say last year I had three residents maybe that had some sort of issue with a call, and this was us switching, you know, 13,000 households of electric. So it really was pretty minimal of a, in that regard. earlier, Jack, I just wanted to clarify, if, our, if we stayed with our current company, 
then would the customer not get that change letter? So most likely if we stayed with Allegro, so if, we, if we're with Allegro now, the only reason they would receive the change letter is yes, if we switch to MC squared or if they were currently one of those ComEd customers under our program, if we did a switch. So if, if there's no switch, they would stick with Allegro. It'd only be a few customers here and there that may be, because it's a renewal, they're gonna relook at everyone's energy profile. It may be a little different. So this year, part of why rates weren't quite as favorable as we thought um, is a lot of people were working from home this last year. So that really changed what your, your usage and hours and timing. So, so there may be a little bit, but a lot less residents, if we don't move, a lot less residents will get notified. I have uh, two, although Trustee Ross maybe answered one of them. Last year, uh, the biggest concern with Allegio was that it was uh, that possibly poor customer service, if I remember correctly, but that's um, minimal. If I heard you say there were really only three complaints and that's just for people trying to opt out. That's right, okay. And then the other real one is for the civic contribution, was that earmarked for anything specifically or does that just go into a, a general fund? Yeah, and that, that's where that opportunity is. So last year it was earmarked towards the general fund capital. So essentially it was just general capital that we we're using it for, nothing specific. Um, you know, last year at this time was when we were entering the pandemic, kind of the unknown of everything. Um, you know, we were a little bit more cautious. This year, again, it, it is just going to the general fund, but there is the opportunity that that is additional funds. It's not necessarily budgeted. So if you wanted to dedicate it to mm -hmm vehicles or so I mean you, the board could say they want that money used for a specific green initiative thank you questions this side trustee Garner um, what I'm hearing is Allegio served us well last year you, and, and I remember we voted in favor of it and that was one of the questions that came up you know would they serve uh, you know what customer complaints would be like and uh, I think if they've served us well and they're gonna give us more money than the MC squared, I think uh, take Woody Allen's advice, take the money and run. I agree. Trustee Hood? I agree. Okay. Um, and then what level? So we were unaware that it went from 100% to 5%, which is the EPA minimum. Um, you guys want to set a threshold there? If Trustee O'Brien? If we're if the goal is to go green anyway and the money is, is extra money, I would go for the hundred percent. I mean I think that is probably the best way to sell it to our not, not that we have to sell it, but the best way you know, I mean we pride ourselves on looking to be green and reduce our carbon footprint and this is a pretty significant way to do it if it's 100% renewal. Um, that, that's 246,000 is pretty significant. Well, and I, I will just say too, that's one of the numbers that's changed from the memo. So the 246 was the pre-bid, the final bid is this, so this would be that 192,952. Still, I mean, I, to me that's a nice trade-off. We're gonna get something to be green. I'd rather be green. Anybody object to doing 100%? Trustee Ross? Um, is there any possibility that those numbers are gonna change before next Tuesday? Would it be to your advantage to, to lock it in now or? No, so they will, they stay good through next Tuesday. So essentially that is part of it is just to kind of get some direction and then now I know who to go to for a contract as well. Um, the other thing too that I uh, knew that we found out or kind of talking to uh, Cher and then also David Hoover of, of NIMEC is so these prices for the 12 to 36 month contracts, it's strongly David Hoover's recommendation today and I am actually in agreement that we consider next week I'll bring a multi-year agreement. The reason being is how the market's trending, it's most likely n not getting, like th these civic contributions essentially aren't gonna go up at this point. They're probably level. The benefit of that is we have a couple years stability and that again, we don't have to go through this every year, have to notify residents every year. There will be some, you know, some comfort if we did maybe a 24 month contract as well. So 
it looks like we're leaning towards what the, our current provider. Yep. We'd like to be at 100%. And are we open to a two or three year contract just to have stability? And I mean, they're matching ComEd's rates. So I, don't, I don't see how you could lose. All right. It sounds like everybody's in concurrence. Yeah, no, that's perfect. All right. Yeah, th thank you. So then that, that is. You got what you need? I got exactly what I need. I have good All feedback. Right. And I will say that was the uh, choice that I, you know, I would pick myself. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I want to get back to being number 30. I don't like being number 83. That's, yeah, one consideration. I think number 30 out of the whole United States is pretty, pretty big. All right. Any other reports, Patrick? No, not tonight. All right. We have no old business, so we're going to move on to new business. <clears throat> the first is approval of ordinance 2021-22, approving a redevelopment agreement between the Village of Gurney and Kensington Development Group, LLC, for property located at 7735 Grand Avenue, Gurney, Illinois. This was the topic of our public hearing tonight. Anything else you want to add, Patrick? No, I can give a quick recap if you want. Okay. Sure. Uh, so as the mayor said, topic of our, of our public hearing at 6.30 tonight, I uh, have an opportunity to partner with Kensington <coughs> Development to bring a Cooper's Hawk out to the Lowe's site on a 2.5 uh, acre parcel up there at Rollins and Grand. Uh, to make that uh, financially feasible, they requested some uh, financial assistance from the village. This comes in kind of two components. Uh, the first is a $600,000 direct contribution to Kensington upon the completion of construction and opening of Cooper's Hawk. The second is up to $900,000 in sales tax uh, sharing paid to uh, Kensington over a maximum of six years from the actual sales tax generated by Cooper's Hawk. So 100% of the state sales tax, half of the village's 1% uh, home rule sales tax. We would re retain the other uh, half of the home rule sales tax for capital as well as the food and beverage tax. Uh, the redevelopment agreements for a period of six years or when $1.5 million um, is rebated, whichever comes first, uh, would be a 15-year lease uh, with Cooper's Hawk. Uh, total investment out there of $7.5 million, uh, 4.5 in the, the building and um, getting it ready um, <coughs> for the uh, restaurant to move in. So funding uh, for the direct contribution uh, would come from economic development reserve funds that have been budgeted over the last three or four years, any year marked for a project like this, and like I said, the other $900,000 comes from actual revenue generated by Cooper's Hawk. All right, questions from the trustees? Move to approve. Second. Motion by Trustee Ross, second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call, please, Andy. <coughs> Good. Yes. Thurstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. That's right. Motion carries parting gift to the village of Gurney, my last big economic development <laughs> initiative. And I will come back for this opening. Okay, item number two, approval of ordinance 2021-23, approval of the annual budget of the village of Gurney, County of Lake, State of Illinois for the fiscal year beginning May 1st. 2021 and ending April 30th, 2022. This was also a topic of our public hearing tonight. Yep, Brian reviewed this at 645 at our public hearing. Uh, pretty consistent with what was presented at the March 1st uh, budget hearing. A couple small tweaks uh, to the general fund that netted out to zero. Capital fund decreased by $35,000. Um, and the water and sewer capital fund, we increase expenditures by $40,000. Otherwise, all the other numbers are consistent with what was presented March 1st. All right, Take a motion to approve. Second. Motion by Trustee Balmas, second by Trustee Thorstenson. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Balmas. Aye. <coughs> motion carries. Item number three, approval of ordinance 2021-24, granting a variation pursuant to the Gurney zoning ordinance for property located at the northwest corner of Eastwood Avenue and Cohasset Court. Cohasset. So close, David. It's 
known as 756 Cohasset Court and 4360 Eastwood Avenue. Sure. Okay. Dave is going to walk us through these next two on the agenda. Right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, so the petitioner, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dombrowski, uh, own a home on Cohasset Court on the village's southeast side. Uh, they purchased an adjacent vacant lot uh, that was part of the original subdivision. Um, when doing so, they also combined the two lots into one lot, which switched their orientation for the zoning front yard. So it switched the, the zoning orientation. The front yard is now s to the south instead of to the east along Cohasset. Uh, their intention is to build a pool alongside their existing home. Uh, to the south of the existing home. The zoning code would prohibit a pool being in the front yard of the newly configured lot. So they um, requested a variation so that the orientation of the home could be switched back to the original orientation with the front yard facing east, uh, consistent with the way their house was originally built. The Planning and Zoning Board reviewed the application. Uh, provided a favorable recommendation to the village board by a vote of four to three, and it is before you tonight for your consideration. Okay. This is kind of a tough one. Questions from the trustees? Move to approve. Second. Motion by Trustee Hood, <coughs> second by Trustee O'Brien to get you by a second. All right, roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Looks aye. All right, motion carries, and congratulations to the Dombrowskis. Are they here? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were here. <coughs> congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy your pool. My favorite. Approval of item number four, <coughs> approval of ordinance 2021-25, annexing property to the village of Gurney. It's approximately 0.94 acres, located at 15629 West Grand Avenue and 35391 North, North Spruce Street in unincorporated Lake County, Illinois. David? Yes, so uh, this is a what's known as an unincorporated donut hole in the village of Gurney's boundaries. Uh, this has been uh, you know, several years that it's been in this uh, orientation since Six Flags was annexed into the village. Um, in order to, you know, a lot of the village services are already provided to this, these properties as far as um, uh, snow removal and things like that. Uh, annexing these properties in will be a limited amount of additional services. Uh, they will uh, come underneath the Village of Gurney Fire Protection, where currently they are under the Warren Waukegan Fire Protection District. So net net, you know, no change in service other than we will lose a, a incremental part of the uh, fire district um, revenue. Um, police response will be from the Village of Gurney versus the uh, Lake County Sheriff. Uh, this is an attempt to clean up some of the village's boundaries, uh, bring in some of the properties that are outliers, and makes sense with uh, some of the, the, the code enforcement and other items that we have in some of our highly visible locations. The forced annexation process is a state statute process. Uh, we, base, we followed all the letters of the law as far as notifications to the property owners, to the other taxing bodies that are affected by it. Uh, gave notice in the newspaper as such, and it is before you tonight for your consideration. And none of the sign signage on that property the, was permitted, so... The signage on the property was not permitted. It is not allowed under the county's UDO. Uh, therefore, it is illegal nonconforming in its current state. Once it becomes annexed into the village of Gurney, we will have the ability to enforce the village's regulations on the signage on that property. Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. 
Thank you, David. I have a motion from Trustee Ballas, a second from Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thor Simpson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Ballas. Aye. This is a good one. Motion carries. All right. Item number five. Approval of Ordinance 2021. 2021-26, amending Chapter 10 of the Gurney Municipal Code and adding Sections 10-70 through 10-78 and amending Chapter 32, Section 32-32 to establish a raffle license fee. Patrick? Sure. So Attorney Winter is going to give us an update on this. He worked oh, okay. uh, bring us in line with state statute. <laughs> Uh, that's correct. Uh, uh, before the pandemic, uh, during the summer of uh, 2019, the governor actually signed legislation um, that amended the Illinois state raffle uh, provisions. Uh, basically, that act um, uh, delegates the authority to control raffles at the local level. But it also sets forth some terms as to um, you know, who would qualify for certain raffles. And it also... Um, uh, legislates, uh, for instance, uh, before the 2019 uh, amendment, each village had to have an aggregate amount that a raffle could not go up to a certain value. Well, over the years, uh, particularly downstate and I think in McHenry, there were some Queen of Hearts uh, raffles that uh, really exceeded expectations up to that point in time. And so the state uh, recognized that and they eliminated that. Uh, most recently, the village has received an inquiry from uh, the American uh, Legion Hall about a Heart of uh, a Queen of Hearts raffle. And so that uh, motivated uh, staff to look at our existing ordinances on this. Uh, the first thing that we discovered is actually our raffle regulations are not in on the website. They're not <coughs> part of our uh, municipal code. So we wanted to correct that. And tonight, we have assigned section numbers so that it's easier for the public to see what our rules are. And then we've also made the changes of including um, that, uh, uh, and I highlighted them in the memo. Basically, we don't have a, a limit per se, although we still track that to the extent that if there's gonna be a fidelity bond posted, we want to know what their expectation is as to that amount, or if it is a specific item that they're raffling off that we know what the, uh, the value of that. Uh, also, the state clarified there was some question as to whether raffle tickets could only be sold then within the village that had issued the license. Well, the state came back and clarified that, and so now, um, provided they have a license, that ticket can be sold anywhere, even outside of uh, the village within the state. Um, uh, the third one is something <coughs> that um, is not directly covered by the amendments to the state statute. Uh, but in some instances, we, we do know from those larger raffle events uh, that traffic issues became an issue. So uh, we don't anticipate that here in Gurney, but if it ever did, uh, the ordinance uh, allows the village to um, request that the uh, raffle location get a special event permit so that we can sit down with them and decide whether there could be some uh, uh, traffic aspects to it. <coughs> and then finally, um, the state statute did provide that in certain instances, the, uh, the village board by majority vote could waive the fidelity bond requirement for a particular raffle. And so we're just, we are just replicating that, re uh, that provision from the state statute in our local ordinance. Um, so uh, tonight, um, uh, this will put it in our municipal code, which is definitely a good thing, and it will be up-to-dated. It has incorporated all the changes made uh, by the bill that was passed um, in 2019 before the pandemic. Thank you, Brian. It's always good to be current. Any questions from the trustees for Brian? Motion to approve. Motion by Trustee Thorstenson, second, second by Trustee Garner. <coughs> Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Six aye. Motion carries. Item number six. Approval of request from Public Works Department to waive bidding requirements 
and purchase central hydraulic system, hook lift system, dump body, snow plow, wing plow, tailgate spreader, and spreader control system from Bonnell Industries at a cost not to exceed $303,007. This is for Public Works units number 264 and 272. Uh, so as is kind of customary uh, with our past approach, once the budget's approved, we bring forward major capital equipment requests to get those in the pipeline because the lead time is so long on them. So the next four items on the agenda are all included in the uh, approved budget that you just approved a little <laughs> bit ago. The first is the public works upfitting of the two chassis that we purchased um, last fiscal year. So as you remember, we reduced equipment purchases due to COVID, but we were able later in the fiscal year, I think in November, to bring forward a request to purchase the two chassis, save the upfitting of those chassis for fiscal year 21-22. Bonnell is the provider that we use. The hook lift system uh, sales are territorial, so Bonnell has control over this territory, so that's where you purchase the stellar hook lift packages through. Uh, we've been using Bonnell since 2011 uh, with our equipment and have been extremely happy with the equipment provided the follow-up service provided, um, the durability um, of the trucks. Uh, so once again, we're requesting uh, to use Bonnell to upfit these two uh, public works chassis. Um, hopeful to have them back around September or October. So, which is good because typically we don't get them back till towards the end of the snow season versus the beginning. So, <coughs> a little earlier in line this year. All right, and that's very necessary equipment. Any questions from the trustees? Trustee Thorstensen? So will um, Mayor Kavar come back to Gurney to drive no. the snow plow during <laughs> Gurney Day's open house? No. <laughs> I never, ever want to see snow again. <laughs> Make a motion to approve. Second. All right. Do I have a motion from Trustee Balmas? Second. Second from Trustee Thorstensen. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstensen. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Looks like. All right. Motion carries. Next item. <clears throat> Approval of police department requests to purchase four 2022 Chevrolet Tahoe state bid contract vehicles at a cost of $162,952. Sure. So the approved budget included the replacement of four Tahoes, uh, Miles Chevrolet uh, as a state bid has the state bid on those vehicles again this year. Uh, we put on our order for four. Uh, they're 40738 each, so that comes up to your 162. Uh, we have 226 in the budget, so that remaining funding uh, will be to upfit these vehicles. These four Tahoes that are being replaced, typically they're rolled down to community development. These are uh, 2014, 2015, and two 2016s. There's pretty much nothing left of these vehicles, and what David has in his fleet currently is in better shape than them. So these will be sent to auction. Questions from the trustees? Move to approve. Second. Motion by Trustee Ross. Second by Trustee Garner. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. <coughs> I moved through this, but this is one shot just for memory's sake. Do we really need all these vehicles? Yes. <laughs> it's a. Yes, it's, we do. It's a, it's a inside. Yeah, that's a. Jeannie and I remember those days. Uh, that's a I. <laughs> Didn't sound like it. All right, motion carries. Right. Yep. Yes. Okay. Item number eight. Approval of request from fire department to waive bidding requirements and utilize the HGAC by ambulance contract number AM20 XA09 to purchase a road rescue ambulance, including striker power load patient lift system from Fire Service Inc. at a cost of $259,368. Sure. Uh, so again, in the in the budget, uh, we used uh, HEAC buy uh, for our last ambulance, actually for a couple pieces of equipment um, throughout our membership with it. It is a buying consortium, so they go out and secure uh, the best pricing. Uh, Fire Service Inc. Um, is a company that we have a long-standing relationship with. Again, been very happy with the 
equipment that they manufacture. Um, as a reminder, we have five ambulances. Uh, so we replace an ambulance every uh, two years. So we get 10 years out of each ambulance. Four are running uh, 24 7, 365, and then one is in reserve for when one of those other ambulances is down for, uh, for service. So um, again, I've worked with this company in the past. Um, very happy with the service that they provide. Uh, the striker power load patient lift system is something that the uh, department uh, implemented a number of years ago to help reduce uh, back and shoulder injuries when loading the patients into the uh, back of the ambulance and it has done just that so the department would like to continue on um, with that piece of equipment and while we're talking about equipment for the ambulance um, the next item on the agenda that's the stretcher and the stair chair again two pieces of equipment um, that we've standardized across ambulances that assist with transporting um, patients and striker uh, provides all that equipment for us. So that's what we're looking to move forward with again. All right, questions for Pat or Chief Kavanaugh? Motion to approve. I have a motion from Trustee Garner, second, second from Trustee Thorstenson. <coughs> Roll call, please, Andy. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Aye. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Falmouth. Aye. Carries. And as Pat mentioned, item number nine, approval of request from fire department to waive bidding requirements and purchase Power Pro XT stretcher and Stair Pro stair chair from Stryker at a cost of $28,211.04. Move to approve. Motion second. by Trustee Ross, second by Trustee O'Brien. Roll call, please. Hood. Yes. Thorstenson. Yes. Ross. Garner. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Thomas. Aye. Who's that? All right. Motion carries. Wow. It's amazing how we do all this with our property tax. Um, and in your packets, um, in case you didn't get that far, uh, we had a resignation from our Civil Service Commission. <coughs> I'm going to leave this appointment to Mary-elect Hood to fill. But if you know anybody good with uh, HR or labor union practices, I'm sure he would take some suggestions of residents in town that would be willing to volunteer many, many hours of their time as community service. So, all right, I will open the floor for public comment. Uh, Wayne Horth, I live at 4981 South Road. Um, you probably remember I was here a month ago, and uh, when that concluded, the uh, mayor graciously invited me to come back, so uh, here I am. Um, I actually didn't plan on coming back, but I, I needed to come back to correct uh, many errors uh, and false things that were said after I gave my uh, talk last time. Um, and then address a few other issues. Um, so I'll just start with um, the vice mayor position. Um, the mayor last time said that the position is the, uh, is just the president pro tem position as envisioned in Illinois municipal law. Uh, the only problem with that claim is that there's nothing in the ordinance that was passed that refers to either the president pro tem or the functions of a president pro tem. There's, I mean, I've read the ordinance uh, I don't think other residents have because you have to FOIA it to get it. <laughs> um, but there's nothing in there that um, that contains the functions of a president pro tem or the, the term president pro tem or anything like that. There's a bunch of powers specified that have nothing to do with the president pro tem. Um, so I'm going to keep bringing this particular issue up <coughs> with the, the new mayor uh, until it gets resolved. Um, and hopefully it does get satisfactorily resolved. Um, <clears throat> the major issue, one of the major issues was uh, the mayor claimed after I, after I talked about Chicago uh, exercising home rule authority repeatedly uh, to regulate the environment, the mayor claimed that Chicago has special home rule powers and special powers to regulate the environment and they do not. Um, and not only do they not have special powers, but the Illinois case law on home rule and on home rule and the environment is made up mostly of cases involving the city of Chicago and Cook County. Um, the first major case in the area 
is City of Chicago v. Pollution Control Board. The, uh, another major case, and the one that's controlling on the environment, is uh, County of Cook v. John Sexton Contractors. Uh, and the two most recent cases also involved the City of Chicago. Uh, there was the StubHub decision, which was the City of Chicago trying to tax uh, StubHub. Um, and the, the most recent decision is the Palm decision, which involved the City of Chicago regulating its condominium. Um, <coughs> so, so that's just one part of it. You know, they don't have any special powers. The case law is based on Chicago and Cook County <coughs> to a large extent. But the second thing is, that the Illinois Constitution prohibits the state from giving Chicago special powers. Article 11 of the Constitution has been interpreted to require the state to provide uniform environmental protection to all municipalities and all residents. And giving a, a particular city special powers would violate that uniform requirement. So it's, it's just simply not the case that Chicago has any special power in that area. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is I sent a, uh, <clears throat> a critique of the uh, Klein, Thorpe, and Jenks, Jenkins memo on home rule to <clears throat> all the trustees. And I just wanted to uh, highlight a few of the issues with that memo here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to highlight a few. The first is, uh, is an easy one, which is that memo again clips a quote from the Illinois Constitutional Convention out of context and changes the quote's meaning. And I've raised this issue several times, and, th and this keeps happening. It, it's really uh, kind of bizarre to me. Um, the memo cites, in one section, uh, there are three cases cited to support something, and two of the three cases uh, involved municipalities that didn't have home rule authority. And the cases actually turned on them not having home rule authority. So those are pretty bad examples to use. Um, and also in all three of the cases out of those, uh, there's three in that section, two are not home rule authority. All three cases were uh, discussed in the John Sexton opinion and they were, and the John Sexton exp opinion explained why they weren't relevant. So it's odd that they would be cited as relevant in this memo. Um, so, and in general, the, the memo misrepresents the John Sexton opinion. Uh, it uses it to claim, it, it pulls a quote out of context to claim that the state has primacy on environmental law. Um, and then it, uh, <coughs> the memo later claims that courts have repeatedly sided with the state when in fact the opposite is true. That in, in John Sexton especially, the court explicitly sided with the county and said that both home rule units and the state can regulate the same environmental issues side by side with no problems. And uh, just quoting from that opinion, the power of the board to set uniform statewide environmental standards and the power of the county to zone property within its boundaries are therefore evidenced as distinct but concurrent powers that must be exercised cooperatively in the interest of environmental protection. To this end, the county in zoning land for landfill sites must adhere to the environmental regulations adopted by the board, while the agency operating under the board's regulations must comply with the county's zoning ordinance when issuing permits for landfill sites. Thus, the authority granted the board under the act <coughs> and the home rule authority granted to the county under the Constitution's Article 7, Section 6 can be exercised in unison to accomplish the public's policy expressed in Article 11, Section 1 of the 1970 Constitution. Article 11 is the environmental protection uh, provision. So, just a... Uh, John Sexton is one of the most important cases, and uh, just a brief explanation of what happened in that case is that the state and a company got together and decided on a landfill site in, in Cook County. And landfills had always been seen as something that's regional, so the state, and there's state law on this in the, in the, in the um, the uh, Pollution Control Board has power over this. So they got together and they said, okay, here's land that is zoned in Cook County for landfill, we'll build it here. So they decided on this. Well, Cook County, when they found out they were building it there, said, wait a minute, we don't like that site anymore. And they rezoned. And they said, you can't put landfills here anymore because houses are there now. It's next to houses. So Cook County said, no, we're rezoning this land. 
landfills have to be over here now. And the state and John Sexton contractors said, we don't care what you say, we have primacy. We can do what we want. And Cook County sued. And the Illinois Supreme Court held in favor of Cook County and said that it doesn't matter that the state has a regional concern here. As long as the state can cite that landfill somewhere, then the, the municipality or the county's law still holds. So, so long as the state could still fulfill its objective, the county's laws had to be respected. And that is the controlling authority still to this day. There's been some modifications of home rule in general, but that is how the state views it for a long time now on the environment. So long as the state's uh, goals are not interfered with, then the municipality's laws, the home rule units laws are valid. <clears throat> so, and then the other thing from this memo that I wanted to, to discuss was something in the memo that I believe was, was deeply offensive to me. A section of the memo claimed that the passage of SB 1852 and SB 1854 constituted implied preemption on the state's part because the state had written this comprehensive scheme of regulation. And I found that very offensive <coughs> because I participated in the writing of 1854 and it took a lot of effort on not just my part, but a lot of other residents in the community. And the reason we did that is because we, told, we were told we had no authority to act locally, so we went to the state. And then by going to the state, we turn around and a memo is issued saying that because we went to the state, we can't act locally now, which is really offensive. <laughs> like, I, I can't tell you how much that's, how upsetting that is. But what's really offensive to me as, as an attorney is that I know that that's completely contrary to Illinois law. Um, and this is just another area where the memo is really bad um, because <clears throat> Um, it's never been the law in Illinois that there's implied preemption in this area. And it's been back and forth years ago that there might be, but the Illinois Supreme Court definitively said that there's not a long time ago. And I'm quoting from Palm, which is a 2011 case. Um, the case is uh, Palm v. 2800 Lakeshore Drive Condo Association. In that case, the court stated explicitly, quoting, uh, further, comprehensive legislation is insufficient to declare the state's exercise of power to be exclusive. To meet the requirements of section 6H, legislation must contain express language that the area covered by the legislation is to be exclusively controlled by the state, and it gives citations. It is not enough that the state comprehensively regulates an area which otherwise would fall into home rule power, citing Village of Bolingbrook for Citizens Utilities Company. After citizens utilities, comprehensive scheme preemption is no longer the law of this state. Um, citing to Board of Trustees of Barrington Police Pension Fund v. Village of Barrington Ethics Board. The General Assembly cannot express an intent to exercise exclusive control over a subject through coincidental comprehensive regulation, citing yet another case involving Cook County. Uh, then it says, see also Scadron, one of the more recent cases. The fact that the state has occupied some field of governmental endeavor or that home rule ordinances are in some way inconsistent with state statutes is not in itself sufficient to invalidate the local ordinances. Uh, then citing to another case, and then finally, the, the last case notes that Illinois is unique in that it is the only state to have no rule of implied preemption. And so, when I read this memo, and I know this, you know, I know all this case law, I read this memo, and this memo has a big section devoted to implied preemption and saying that, oh, we're preempted because of this law that you just helped pass. And I know, in fact, that the Supreme Court, not only did we not have implied preemption, the Supreme Court has forcefully stated there is no implied preemption in Illinois. So it really makes you, it really makes you wonder about the competence of this memo when it makes these big grand claims about a part of the law that doesn't exist in Illinois. Implied preemption, is, it, it, there's, it's not a thing. Um, so, um, so moving on from the memo, uh, at the state level, recently there was a defeat of the uh, fence line monitoring bill uh, that would apply to vanches that was put forward by Joyce Mason. 
And uh, that was largely as a result of uh, opposition from the Illinois EPA. Uh, the director of the Illinois EPA, John Kim, testified, um, and he, he, uh, he wanted to make it known when he testified that he was testifying as an opponent, which was nice. Um, and this is despite scientists who testified that it's a given that Vantage will have undetected major leaks from their method of loading ETO via rail cars, and that the same problem occurred with benzene and fence line monitoring was essential in locating those leaks and figuring out how to fix them. Um, despite this, uh, and, the, and the scientists also noted that benzene is a much less dangerous chemical than ethylene oxide, uh, but much higher regulation exists around that. Um, so despite this, the Illinois EPA director testified that they didn't think it was necessary. It's, uh, to me, it's kind of like uh, the foolish coronavirus uh, plans that say that if you don't test, then there's no infections. If we don't test for ETO in the air, if we don't have fence line monitoring, there's no leaks, you know? If, if, if we just don't test for it, we can pretend they're not there. Um, and just like the coronavirus, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, it doesn't go away just because you don't test for it. <coughs> um, so. I just wanted to say that the, uh, the defeat of the fence line monitoring at the state level is, uh, is not the end of uh, our activism, our pursuit of uh, change. It's just the beginning. And it's the beginning of a return to the local level. And that we've given local leaders a lot of time to prepare while we worked at the state level. Uh, but uh, we're going to be coming back and asking for more. And um, there was a recent environmental town hall. And uh, at the end of that town hall, Representative Rita Mayfield spoke. She spoke during it, but at the end she spoke and she gave a summary of her thoughts. And uh, unfortunately the video is not available yet, so I can't give direct quotes, but I was listening. And uh, I do know that uh, her summary was that local leaders need to step up. And she said that local leaders, she sees them attend the meetings and nod their heads and then not do anything. And she said, uh, they could end this all tomorrow. That's pretty close to a direct quote. It was something along those lines. Uh, and you know, it was pretty refreshing to hear that because so many of the politicians have pretty clearly been holding their thoughts, not wanting to step on anyone's toes for a long time, not wanting to make trouble for anyone. Uh, but she just came out and said it, you know, there, there needs to be action and it could, they could end this tomorrow. And I agree with what she said. Um, the time for asking the state to solve Gurney's problems is past. And it's time for Gurney to solve its own problems. And it's time for Gurney to do what local leaders did in Depew, which is a, a small uh, town in Illinois. I, I forget what it is, 600 and something residents. Uh, but when the, vi the village of Depew has environmental contamination, and <coughs> Depew actually is a big part of the case law in environment and home rule, they have environmental contamination all over town from a phosphate fertilizer factory. And the companies involved uh, were purchased a lot, but eventually were uh, held by Exxon Mobil and CBS Viacom. Those companies were dragging their feet on cleaning up all that contamination that's all over town. So what did the village do? They didn't say we're powerless. They passed an ordinance to, to try to force a quicker cleanup. And they got sued. And they lost that case because the court said, you don't have home rule. You're only like 600 people. So what did the village do? They gave themselves home rule right away. They passed a new ordinance. They went back to court and they lost that case too. And the reason they lost that is because uh, of an issue of uh, something that doesn't really apply to Gurney, which is that the environmental contamination is all over the ground. And if it's not cleaned up properly, it could go in the river and it would travel to other villages nearby. And in fact, some of the contamination is already in other villages. Because it could travel if not done correctly, the state has trump rights. Basically the state trumps in that case because the state has a right to protect the other villages from what they're doing in Depew. So in that particular instance, 
This is actually one of the cases that defined the boundary. Um, the village of Depew was not able to act because their actions could contaminate other villages. Of course, this doesn't apply in Gurney because if Gurney were to say no more ethylene oxide, that's not going to contaminate another village. It's not going to, tr it's not going to step on any rights of the state. The state has an interest in ensuring that any ethylene oxide pollution that occurs in Gurney, that any usage is below what they permit, that it doesn't exceed their permit. The village can do anything so long as it does not interfere with that limit the state has set. If it goes below, that's fine. The state's limit is still in force. If the village tries to say, oh, you could do double what the state says, the village would lose. You can't do that because the state has set a minimum level, uh, a uniform level. You're not allowed to, uh, it's, it's essentially all about what is the state's interest. And the state's interest is not in ensuring a certain amount of ethylene oxide is used. It's in ensuring that a maximum is held, that you can't go above that maximum. Below that, the state doesn't care. They don't have an interest. Their only interest is ensuring you don't break that limit that they set. That's what the permitting program is. Um, so, interestingly enough, Depew was, uh, of course, these lawsuits didn't bankrupt the village. Um, and not a single leader there regrets what they did, even though they did lose in that case because of this contamination that they could cause to everyone else. And cleanup finally began last year after federal movement. They got put on a special list after more than 25 years of contamination and, and no one doing anything. The companies drug their feet and were able to drag it out 25 years. And that's, that's you know, I won't say that's typical because that's a long time, but many, many years of delay and dragging out is, is pretty typical. Um, and that's what's happening here. I mean, right now, at the state level, we've hit a roadblock because the lobbying dollars have come out from, from all corners. And they will, they will stop anything that we try from this point forward, most likely. Uh, they'll certainly try. Um, so I would say <coughs> that, um, you know, just and so that's my summary. And uh, I'm going to keep returning to these issues uh, as long as it takes, um, you know, to get some progress on these issues. And I would urge you to, uh, you know, to listen to what Representative Mayfield said, which is that local leaders, uh, it's time for them to step up. Um, thank you. Are you done? Yeah. Completely done? All right, because I did not say the city of Chicago had special home rule power. They do have special power because they have an air pollution control board, so they can do things with airs that we can't, and that is the special power that they have. Any, any city that has an air pollution control can do some things that we can't do. We don't have one, so we rely on the IEPA. It's interesting how you never bring the letter forward from your previous pro bono lawyer that no longer works for Stop ETO that said it's not black letter law and that it would be a 50-50 chance in court and that somebody needs to set the precedence. You also never completely include the Klein Thorpe opinion that was given to Willowbrook. You always leave out the part where they said that it is not black letter law. But we know that you think you know more than every municipal attorney in the state even though you don't have a law license and you've never practiced law and you've never practiced municipal law. So we are not going to go to court based on your opinion when no other municipal attorney that we have talked to, no one agrees with your opinion. So we have to use tax dollars and we in good conscience could never go to court based on your opinion when there is no municipal attorney that agrees with you. But you know what? You did get your candidate elected mayor in Waukegan, so I expect you to have her shut down Medline on May 4th, and if Waukegan prevails over the injunctions, they prevail in court over all the lawsuits, we might follow their lead. But let them spend their tax dollars on the fight. If what you say is right, let them go prove it by shutting Medline down May 4th. Ann Taylor has the power, you got her elected. If what you say is true, if it's not, that won't happen on May 4th. But we'll see, we'll watch what they do, and if they win in court, then I'm sure this board will consider it. Any other public comment?
Do I have a motion to adjourn? Double. Motion Second. by Trustee Balmas, second by Trustee Garner. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.